Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the sun is trying to come through, try to chase away all that snow we had last week. And uh, we're glad you're here to talk about transportation today. It's a game changer for care coordination. Uh, welcome. This is Mary Megliola Franzen. I am one of the project managers here at Healthier Here. And we have guests today presenting, and I will be introducing them in just a moment. Uh, what I want to do first is take care of a couple quick housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, uh, Lisa, let's take the next slide. Uh-oh. There we go. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, there's a little orange arrow, and that's how you can open and close that box for communicating. If you want to type in a question, you can expand that little question box and then type in your question in that little window and hit send, and our staff will be able to see it. Melissa Warner is with us today. She's going to be monitoring chat throughout this webinar, so chat in whenever. We'll answer via chat if that's appropriate, or our speakers have agreed to uh, interrupt. If we think it's a, a good time, we can just post the question right away. You also might want to do some talking, in which case you need to put up your hand. Um, there's a little hand icon there, and when you do that, that raises your hand, and we know that you uh, would like to say something. Right now, everybody's in mute, but we can unmute you and start the conversation. One more thing is that today, our broadcast is being captioned. This is the first time we've done this. Um, as some of you know, we're trying out different formats, different times, different things with these webinars. Well, today's our first day of closed captioning. So in our survey later, or if you want to shoot us an email later, we're very interested in hearing what you think and how it went. If you care to read the captioning, you need to open a new browser window, and there's the link that will take you to captioning. And I think the link also is in the chat box right now, or has been chatted out to folks right now. Um, if you have trouble connecting, you again, you know, send us a quick chat on that, and we'll, we'll make sure you have the information to be able to do that. So now we can get started. I'll introduce our speakers. We have today Julie Povic here, who has graciously donated her time and attention from Seattle Children's to talk about transportation for the patients on Medicaid. Julie has been with Children's uh, more than 30 years, and for more than 10 years, I think I have this right, she's been a manager with external affairs at Seattle Children. She manages the NEMT program, which is non-emergency medical transport. That benefit includes actually transportation, lodging, and meals, but today we're just talking about the transportation piece. Uh, and transportation brings us over to our second presenter, Justin Bergener, who has his roots on the other side of the mountains from here. He's originally from Yakima, and he's been working in the world of transportation for more than 20 years. His expertise is built upon a solid foundation of education, including business, sociology, organizational behavior, and entrepreneurship. He has been an active part of Washington State's Long-Term Planning Commission, and right now he's the founder and CEO of Going. So I will turn this over to Julie. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello there. My name is Julie Povic, and I've worked at Seattle Children's Hospital off and on for over 38 years. I tell people that I consider it my Hotel California in the fact that I can check out, but I can never leave. I have come and gone a few times, and I decided about 10 years ago to just find a way to stay and make it work. And I'm glad I did. I worked on the inpatient units for over 25 years, and now I'm in management where I work closely with a department called Guest Services. This has made me intrinsically aware of the truth and any emotions behind the statement, I just want to go home. And when you interact every day with people who have children who are sick and or dying, it makes it so you really want to find a way to help them do just that. And I think that I probably need to put a disclaimer out there that I'm not only a glass is half full person, I am a glass is overflowing onto the saucer kind of a person. I see the realities and the challenges of NEMT, but this is the only way of thinking, this way of thinking is the only way that I can continue to have the energy and the drive to find ways to improve the system and to get our patients home. At the end of this presentation, you will have the opportunity to, to participate in a Seattle Children's Hospital survey. I was asked to mention that this survey is not a part of Healthier Here's initiatives. It is mine. I want to capture everyone's voice and perhaps form a small work group to address NEMT issues that those of, 
that are listening cannot afford the resources that we have here at Children. I know that saying Medicaid transportation is super challenging would be an understatement, but everything is easier with friends, or even better yet, with the power of a village. I am not saying please call me with all of your issues. I think that would be overwhelming and probably more than just a little bit scary. What I am saying is let's find a systematic way of, for everyone's voice to be heard, to understand what the issues are, how those issues fit in with Medicaid transportation guidelines and regulations, and what we can do to address and minimize them. Justin is here with me, who just brought over a new fleet of vehicles from Eastern Washington to help with our lack of drivers and has new software that will hopefully bring much needed technology to Medicaid transportation. And he will be discussing that later in this presentation. So this is how Medicaid transportation works in a nutshell. The Healthcare Authority, also known as Washington Medicaid, contracts out with social services agencies or transportation companies in order to provide Medicaid transportation, and those folks are called brokers. This is known as NEMT, or non-emergency medical transportation. It is separate from what most people think of as Medicaid, so their concern is the cost of transportation not necessarily how their decisions will impact the overall cost of the patient's Medicaid debt bill, and what that does not, when well, that does not make any sense. It is what it is. Most states have one broker, but Washington is one of the very few states that is divided into six geographical areas or brokers. It was determined transportation needs and resources are very different depending on where you are in the state, which is why each broker has slightly different roles. Here is an example. The broker on the eastern side of the mountains is called People for People, and they transport their patients in vans. So they only let the patient, and if they're a child, one caregiver can be transferred to the appointment. That is because if they allowed more people in the family to come, less patients would be able to fit on those vans. King County, on the other hand, provides taxis or, and or bus fare. So it's not that important if more people come. I personally like the six broker model. Hopelink is the only 24 seven broker and they transport patients home regardless of where they live. If they have been in King County or Snohomish County overnight. And while they can take them home, they cannot go out of their counties to pick them up. Everyone must stay in their lane. NEMT does not currently use Uber or Lyft to provide Medicaid transportation and this is true pretty much nationwide. That is because they do not have enough insurance coverage, cannot pass the background checks the state requires, and it is very hard to regulate the rideshare industry. The other day we had a taxi driver do something that was just not okay. We called the taxi company and talked to his supervisor. We agreed he needed to be held accountable and not ever do that again. If the rideshare company had a driver who did something wrong, there would be no one for us to call to hold him accountable and our patients deserve accountability and to be kept safe. It is illegal for brokers to provide the rides themselves, and so they need to contract the rides out to transportation providers such as Eastside for Hire, Northwest Transport, and MedStar. So my little person there on the, is there on the phone is the HopeLink call center person who provides rides in King County and Snohomish counties, and they will receive a call from a healthcare organization or a patient to book a ride. The broker needs to ve verify that there's a medical necessity for the ride because people have abused Medicaid transportation in order to get a free ride into the city or the general facility where the, the general area where the facility is in. Additionally, not all Medicaid plans cover transportation to all appointments. Medicaid has many different tiers and it is important to know what tier the patient is on. Some plans only cover rides to dialysis and diabetes and the appointment needs to be billed to Medicaid. If Medicaid is not paying for the appointment, they are not paying for the ride. For future appointments, rides are sent electronically to transportation providers at night in two separate downloads. The first one is the rides HopeLink would like them to do. The second one is the rides the transportation provider has agreed to do. They, in turn, will dispatch those rides to those drivers. They often get sent more rides than they can handle because of the lack of drivers. Once they accept them, they need to do them or send them back. If a vehicle breaks down, 
all the rides assigned to that vehicle are sent back to Hopelink or to the, to the transportation provider's dispatch to be reassigned. This takes a very well executed plan for the day and throws it out the window. The driver needs to either complete the rides they are given, return them, or no-show the rider. For same-day rides, transportation providers do not need to accept the ride, and so the ride might sit there waiting for a company to accept it. Now, it's important to know at what stage the ride is not happening. Did Hopelink or the transportation company not dispatch it? Is the driver stuck in traffic? Or did the driver already come and no-show the, the patient? Taxi drivers are an interesting bunch. A lot of them are stay-at-home parents and mainly work when school is in session. And there are some holidays where there are significantly less taxi drivers. Last week, when it snowed, a taxi company with almost 500 drivers had only 10 drivers driving. Everyone else stayed home. So last week, when Hopelink assessed the snow situation, not only did they deem the weather conditions unsafe, but they had very few drivers to dispatch their rides to, even when they tried. In 2008, we started looking at how our patients on Medicaid came for care. We looked at the amount of time and resources we were putting into transportation issues. Families were afraid of missing their rides home, and so they were asking everyone to call Hopelink to check on their rides. They were not wanting to stay for additional appointments we deemed necessary, not taking the time to pick up their prescriptions. Their minds were often on the ride home when we were trying to give them last-minute instructions. We reached out to the state ride brokers to better understand their constraints and how we could work with them. We looked at how long patients and staff waited on hold and for the ride home. When it became apparent how much time and energy it took our staff to coordinate and schedule rides, we knew we had to do something about it. Drivers were driving up the drive and then documenting the families as no-shows when sometimes the driver didn't even come into the lobby. They were able to say they did, but we didn't have anyone to hold them accountable. Staff throughout our organization were constantly on hold, calling Hopelink, trying to find out when a patient would be picked up. There were times when multiple people were calling about the same patient. We met with Lynn Moody and Tom Campbell at Hopelink, among others, so that we could better understand our options. One of our options was to form a partnership and to create a Hopelink desk in our outpatient lobby, which is exactly what we did. We pay the salary of a Hopelink employee who sits in our lobby and coordinates our Medicaid rides. This does not come cheap. We also have a children's hospital employee at the desk to assist and handle issues with other brokers. In the beginning, they did nine rides a day. Now they coordinate over 50. They interact with all the Washington State brokers, as well as patients from Idaho, Montana, and Alaska. The desk allows us to do several things. One, to streamline the process. The ride is dispatched when the family is done with the appointment. Thus, the family is able to do what they need to do while they are in our, in our building. This includes extra appointments we want to schedule, as well as picking up meds and pharmacy. It makes it so the family is more relaxed and their mind is not on their ride home. It also makes it so that transportation is centralized. And lastly, the patient can book their ride for an upcoming appointment before they leave. We learned that knowing the guidelines and the regulations backwards and forwards, we could hold the brokers, transportation providers, and drivers accountable. And it helped that we had a really loud voice. Unfortunately, Medicaid transportation falls into the hurry up and wait type scenarios all day and every day. Riders and healthcare workers get upset when the regulation that the driver only has to wait five minutes. The reason behind this particular regulation is because they are picking up other patients with exact pickup windows before and after the one that the provider or the patient is waiting, wanting them to wait for. Waiting for one person can throw the rest of the rides off for the day and send everything into a tailspin. People are often rushing to rides and leaving appointments early to ensure they are ready at the designated spot at the designated time. One of the best things about having a Hopelink desk in our outpatient lobby is that it's, the spot, it's a centralized spot for drivers and riders to connect. Everyone knows they are in the right place and there is someone there who knows they are waiting for a ride, knows who is coming to pick them up, 
and knows roughly when the driver will arrive. And while we sometimes need to look all over our building for a patient who is wandering around, the best thing we ever did was have one place for patients to wait and for someone who knows what and who they are waiting for. Shortly after we started the, the desk, a driver came into the lobby and indicated they were called for a ride at 1215. The family wasn't there, and so they were leaving without them. The HopeLink person said, no, I called for the ride to be at 1230. You are early, so sit down and wait. They were unprepared for the person who called for the ride to be sitting in the lobby when they arrived. And word spread fast, so it is no longer an issue. We had drivers not connect with a family sitting in the lobby and referred to them as a no-show. We stopped that as well. The reason for this is because um, Medicaid pays taxi drivers less and there's no tip. So they go to where the cruise ships are or where they might get better tips. Technology, like the kind that Justin is going to talk about, will hopefully make connecting the rider to the ride more efficient and far less frustrating for all. Every morning, we spend 10 to 15 minutes discussing the day and upcoming transportation challenges. And once a week, the vice president, who I report to, comes and checks in with the folks at the desk. Yes, this takes a lot of time, but it is proactive time. This keeps our average wait time for rides to roughly 30 to 40 minutes during the day. It is an easy decision to take time in the morning to ensure that our families are not waiting hours to go home. Huddles are a time where I listen to their suggestions on how to improve the work or discuss the challenges that might come up during the day. They are the experts. We try to find ways to make their ideas happen. We talk about if there's a Husky game, if the Seahawks are playing, or if Beyonce is in town, things that will impact tra traffic and transportation. We discuss the patients who are discharging and where they are going. Will we have enough drivers and the transportation providers to handle the rides that we expect will happen that day? We want to make sure the folks at the desk will have the support they need. Coordinating Medicaid transportation is difficult when our nurses want the patient to be discharged and the weather or the traffic make it so the family will not get to leave as quickly as the clinical team would like them to. We are very lucky to have Jason, who started the desk back in 2008, and the wonderful Tiffany, who works for HopeLink. They both know everything backwards and forwards. I often ask them, but what does your gut tell you? They are two very smart people. We keep track of the workload yeah, um, at the desk and make sure that no one is expected to do more than they can. When the workload gets too high, we take something off their plate. A good example of this was they indicated that they were getting too many general questions from people coming into the lobby. It was their correct impression that entrance staff should answer the questions that did not pertain to transportation. We tracked down the number of questions they got each day and determined that it was they talked to over an average of, sorry, determined that it was an average of over 100 families that asked them questions including directions and things about different clinics. I talked to the supervisor of the entrance staff and the number went down significantly. Without knowing the exact number of questions we got, I doubt I would have been listened to. Another example is the question around rides for future appointments. Should they be expected to do this? Should the call center in Bellevue? We knew from surveying our staff who interact with HopeLink that the error rate in Bellevue is higher than the error rate at the desk. So what can we do to ensure that my staff feel that they can handle the workload? We spent a lot of time asking if they had all the information and resources they need to perform the tasks we are asking them to do. We keep accurate track of wait times. What is more powerful? Our patients wait a really long time or our patients wait 2.5 hours after a visit to the ER, and I can provide you with the provider one numbers, dates, and times for the past year of who waited and for how long. I actually don't know the exact amount of time our patients wait in the emergency room after hours. And the reason for this is because it's hard to get other people to collect data. I can tell you exactly how long somebody has waited between the hours of 7 a.m. and 6 p.m., because that is when our desk is open. But after that and on weekends, I just have guesstimates and lots and lots of emails when the wait time was extremely long. This is the form we use to request rides, as well as the form that is on the HopeLink website. We often need to circle back to staff to remind them to fill out the entire form. 
An often forgotten field is to fill in is the provider one number. Yes, it only takes a few minutes to fill that in, but if you receive a multitude of faxes, that adds up. And since everyone has a separate provider one number, there is less chance of error, so it is important that it's on the form. Faxing allows us to keep everyone accountable. When social work complains the ride was late or the driver left without completing the ride, it is often because they forgot to mention what equipment was needed. When the driver gets there and does not have the equipment they need or the right kind of vehicle, they cannot complete the ride and they do not get paid. And when that happens, the driver drove there for free, gets upset, and doesn't necessarily want to come back. Brokers and drivers need to feel confident they have all the information they need to drive the patient home safely and to get paid for the trip. Drivers and transportation providers have memories like elephants. If they came for a ride and it was difficult in any way, they will remember and not want to come back. We had a patient who at the last minute the nurse remembered to mention the patient was on oxygen and the patient only had one tank. This was a problem because the patient lived in Kennewick and was going over the path. When we asked for another tank, we realized the nurse had no idea where the patient lived or even where Kennewick was. We had another where the nurse forgot to mention that mom was in a wheelchair. Part of discharge coordination is knowing where your patients live and what equipment is needed to get them home. When we have patients who go over the path, we often give them snacks for the ride home. Medicaid transportation is only important to the healthcare industry if they care if their patients arrive to their appointments and if they go home when they are discharged. So that means yes. During the recent snow event, we had Hope Link's status of red or yellow alert announced at all of our leadership huddles. Can we get our patients out safely? And if yes, how soon? Some healthcare organizations pay more attention to transportation than others. Across the nation, it seems to be what type of public transportation is available and how far their patients need to travel. There is a county in Texas that had to decide if they wanted public transportation or a football stadium, and of course, they picked the stadium. We care about transportation because we have kids who come from Washington, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho, which is roughly one quarter of the nation's landmass. We have to help them home. There's not an option. Nurse and discharge coordinators need to put transportation into the discharge plan. Rides that are paid for by Medicaid require children are in car seats, so you need to tell HopeLink if the parent is bringing a car seat or if HopeLink will need to provide one. HopeLink pays extra for the trip if the taxi supplies the car seat, but it's getting harder and harder to find taxis that have car seats, so we need to encourage families to have their own. We are all partners in this, and sometimes it takes a while to find out who your partners are and to make it so they like you, or at least like working with you. You need to convince yourself and them that you are all on the same team. It's important for everyone to have a team mentality, the industry is moving quickly, and I personally believe that those who are not team players will be left behind or out, in the loop, out of the loop. An interesting fact, um, some, of the family, some of the money comes from the state and some from the federal government. And quite a while back, the federal government hired auditors to check random files at the brokerages. The auditors at the beginning were strict, but then they got a little bit lax. So then they hired auditors to audit the auditors. You have to love the bureaucracy of the federal government. The brokers need to trust you. And what I do is I go visit them. I assure that I know they might get audited and I always say that I'm not trying to get them to do something they don't want to do or can't do. I want them to work within the parameters of what they feel comfortable with. I want them to pass the audit. My goal is if an auditor comes and pulls a file that the broker says, oh, thank goodness it's a children's file, because they know if it's one of my patients, they will have the documentation they need. If your ride consistently doesn't happen on time, you need to find out why. Sometimes it's because of where the facility is located, or the home is off the beaten track, so there are no taxis in the area. If so, that means the taxis need to drive far to get where they're going, which means that they might be late. And once they are there, there are no rides for them to pick up on the way back to wherever it is that they like to hang out. 
So there is zero incentive for them to do the ride. Drivers have the ability and or the right to say no to any ride and they do not need to give a reason, which puts Hopelink in a heck of a predicament. They are the middleman. When we have rides that don't happen, I try to find out why and see if there's something we can do to change that. Sometimes, lots of times, Hopelink just screws up. But other times, there are issues that surround the structure of Medicaid transportation that are at the root of why something went wrong. We have a huge issue with wrong addresses. Sometimes the ride is sent to the wrong house. Sometimes the patient refuses to come out of the house. Sometimes they go to the wrong regional children's hospital site through no fault of their own or of the driver. Every day, in every way, is different. It's like educating a parade, and Medicaid transportation is definitely a team sport. No one wakes up in the morning and says they want to make it so someone doesn't get medical care. My advice, give everyone the benefit of the doubt. They are not just resources, there's just not enough resources to go around. And I like to think that everyone really needs to know where they fit in the solution. I think it's important for everyone to know they are part of a large puzzle and they need to know the perspective of the other people holding the other pieces of the puzzle. I remember when I brought a transportation provider into the command center of Providence Medical Center and they saw all the work the hospital did to get the patients discharged on time and how hospitals work hard to shave off even a few minutes of wait time. And when you show all that work to a company that made a patient wait eight hours for a ride home the day before, it changes their perspective on what is, re what is reasonable. His eyes were huge. Sometimes, because of who is at the helm of the company, it's hard, if not impossible, to get them to be on your team. And if that is the case, look for other partners in the team that can fill the gap. If the broker is difficult to work with, work with the transportation companies. Make them your friends. If they are difficult, work with the drivers, other healthcare organizations, or even other brokers. I have made brokers and HCA my friends and partners. Find anyone and everyone to be on your team. I always say that Tiffany and Jason, who works the Medicaid transportation desk, do all the work while I just talk about it. You need to go to where the work is done and find out what is really going on. The people on the ground, they are the experts. Who are their friends? What are their workarounds, and how can you support them in their decisions? When I hear this ride didn't happen, or the driver was late, okay, well, what didn't happen? And how late was the driver? Late is a relative term. When we have an issue, we ask the broker, the transportation provider, and the, and the rider, okay, so what happened? And the truth is usually somewhere in the middle. It needs to be a non-judgmental question. What happened and what can we do to ensure that it just doesn't happen again? I had a meeting with a non-Medicaid driver last week who had some performance issues and I said I wasn't mad or pointing fingers. I just wanted to know what was going on. It was obvious that he was struggling to dispatch and I wanted to know how I or someone on my team could help him. When Jason worked for Hopelink, he dispatched rides and he gave him pointers on when and how to say no and how to give re reasonable expectations. It's not always about saying yes. It's about having the correct information and reasonable expectations. When we tell families the wait time, it needs to be accurate so they can plan even small things like, do they have time to go to the bathroom? Accurate information is key and always assume if you lie or make it up, somebody will know. It's about standing up, not just for your patients, but for every member of the team. And we not only consider the drivers an important part of the team, we let them know that. We had a family who complained they were, they were always no-showed. We called the transportation provider and were able to look into the brokerage notes and found that the family waited upstairs in their apartment until the ride showed up. If our patients regularly no-show or are mean to the call center at the brokerage, we want to know about it so that we could tell them the importance of being polite to the folks who are helping them get a free ride to the appointment. Sometimes the family that waited upstairs took 20 minutes to collect their things and get down to the parking lot. By that time, the driver who only had to wait five minutes was long gone, which was the reason for all the no-shows for the family. Everyone needs to do their bit for thousands of rides a day to go off as planned. Communication is key. 
never assume the driver, the patient, or the staff will know anything and everything without being told. Last fall, we repaved one of our entrances, and when we did that, it made us realize just how overwhelmed and stressed out our parents and families were. The project lasted about two months, and for the first couple weeks, we escorted every single family to the entrance we were using on a temporary basis. The first day of the project, I went upstairs to escort a family and said, Hi, my name is Julie, and I'm here to walk you to where your wife is waiting. And the family refused to come with me. They were, afraid, they were afraid to leave what was familiar with somebody they did not know. I went over to the desk and asked Tiffany, will you please tell them to trust me and that I will take them where they need to go? And while it was the first time a family preferred to wait in the place that was wrong, that, that was wrong but familiar, it was not the last time. We put tape on the walls, we put footprints on the floor, we put signs up every few feet showing them that this was the way to the other entrance but they were still so worried about missing their transportation that they didn't want to leave the entrance that was closed that they were familiar with. At the end of the two months, we were still escorting roughly 30% of the families. This taught us a lot. It taught us that the families were in survival mode and can't handle one more thing. It taught us how the families really needed our help in connecting with the ride and how afraid they were about not getting home. Most of these families had been in our building a dozen or more times and they were familiar with our surroundings. In the beginning of our current construction project, we had a few new challenges with pickups and drop-offs. We knew the drivers were upset with some of our staff were telling them, so we listened, and more importantly, we acted on what they said. We made sure employees were polite and understood the driver's perspective. The message we wanted them to hear was, we want you to feel welcome. We have your back. You are family. Yes, some members of the family are a bit dysfunctional, but that's true wherever you go. I have a button on my office wall that says, we are all someone else's really weird coworker. It's about respecting that someone else might have a difference of opinion about the patient, broker, or driver and working with them. It's about telling the patients to be nice to the brokerages and the drivers. The drivers being nice to the patients and the brokers knowing the patients by name and understanding why they do what they do and being compassionate. It's about hearing the stories of the drivers and our own staff, following up politely and reminding everyone that the passenger is sick. It is not about not playing the blame game. It's not my fault the ride isn't here. It's Medicaid's fault, the broker's fault, the driver's fault. For our patients, their appointments start with when they leave home. They feel the ride in and back home is part of the, their children's hospital experience. How do I know this? Because of the complaints I get about the rides from the patients and the staff. It's about working on the same team and giving everyone the benefit of the doubt. Everyone on the Medicaid transportation team has a tough job. Everyone. It's tough work. I can't imagine being a Medicaid driver. They drive sick or terminally ill people around Seattle traffic all day long. Talk about tough. And they can make it or break it for you. A driver will bend over backwards for a patient they adore. They will work hard for people and organizations that treat them with respect. Often, they get the brunt of everyone's mistake. When they arrive late, they can either be met with, oh, I'm so glad you're here, thank you so much for coming, or someone will yell at them for not having the right equipment or being there on time. Candy and respect, and sometimes even access to a really nice bathroom can go a long way. Yep. And while it's easy to call and complain to HCA or HopeLink when things go well, it's not an easy way to make friends. And sometimes what happens is really, truly, horribly awful. But if you don't know the rules that govern the process, the complaint, unfortunately, will go nowhere. Know the rules and not just the whack. That just scratches the surface. I've been doing this for over a decade, and there are still things that come up that I know little or nothing about. Too many times, people only communicate when things go wrong. I email or call my contact at HCA when things go well. They like to hear stories about how brokers made things work. They like to hear stories of when things go well. Keep in mind that HCA was the one who selected the social services agency in the first place, and the bidding process was very long and arduous. It's always good to make them feel they made the right decision in, order, in selecting the broker. 
saying this broker or the call center staff is an idiot is not a great way to fix the issues one is experiencing. Healthcare and transportation speak totally different languages. If you find someone you connect with, hold on to them. Make them your friend. May I talk just a moment? Yep. Do we have a question that's been chatted in? Okay. And, uh, is it okay with you if I sure. draw? Okay, great. Uh, the question is, do you have suggestions or recommended policies for clinics and providers in understanding the trickiness of Medicaid transportation? Um, in particular, around policies for late arrivals and no-shows in a way that doesn't end up punishing the patient for circumstances that are outside that person's control. Well, that is a very good question, and Justin is going to love that question <laughs> because his software that he has created um, is something that, and Justin can speak more to this than I can, so I'll speak briefly, and then um, in just a minute it will be his turn to talk, and he can follow up on that. Um, but his software is going to make it so that we will know when a patient will be arriving late. And so we would be able to call the clinic and tell them this patient is on their way, their Medicaid transportation is bringing him, and this is the exact moment they will arrive. And that will make it so that the clinics will know that it's not the patient's fault, and they'll be able to schedule another patient in while they wait for that first patient. So, Justin, I'm sure you're beaming with that question. <laughs> Is it Segway? Oh, oh okay. No, you skipped okay. one. Oh, sorry. Didn't you? Oh, no. no. You're right. Perfect. So we just applied. This is a perfect segue. Thank you for that question. We just applied for a grant with People for People and going to provide transportation, coordinated transportation for our patients over the mountains. Why? This grant will allow us to know exactly when our patients from over the pass are arriving. We will be able to have interpreters, social workers, and nurses be able to plan their day. That is huge. We'll be able to arrange our clinic appointments and operating room times around if a patient is coming and or if they will be late. Right now, we just hope they are coming at the time we expect them and don't know until they actually arrive. The other day, I was up in the lobby and an interpreter and a patient navigator were waiting in the lobby for the van. And it turned out the patient wasn't even on the van they were waiting for. Just imagine for a minute if they could stay in their offices working until the van was five minutes away, or if we knew the patient wasn't coming, we could cancel the interpreter before they left home. Now, if the patient doesn't arrive at the last minute, we still have to pay the interpreter 75% of the appointment. But if we can cancel ahead of time, we don't pay them, change, we're able to change our workflow and patient flow, and it's a huge cost in time savings. So, as I mentioned, we have Justin here, and he will tell you his story and answer that question more in depth of how he started in Medicaid transportation growing up in Yakima, how MedStar will help us with the driver shortage in King and Snohomish counties, and how he's helping move NEMT technology into the 21st century. Great. Hi, I'm Justin Bergener, and thank you, Julie, so much for that introduction. If I could just take a minute and help answer that question. Thanks so much for the question. Um, of course, questions can come in any time and my my experience with that question is that the fundamental basis of that question is about policies and rules and those vary program by program and whether you're a taxi provider or a traditional NEMT provider or Seattle Children's Hospital it takes a lot of staff just to understand the rules in your dealing with different payment methods and different tiers of Medicaid. And so going, going is really a rules-based system that helps prevent and uh, stop misunderstandings and proactively communicate at the right times what that wait time might be and where people are at and how long they've been waiting. And so it's there to assist you um, especially for NEMT type transportation. And um, that's that's part of our real program of what we're trying to do is to automate some of the communication because as Julie talked, a lot of the challenges come around uh, real-time communication because the drivers are busy, the providers are busy, the brokers are busy, and, and so are the individuals and the staff members at Seattle Children's. And so by bringing that kind of collaboration with the GPS, 
and bringing it all the way down to the rider is really the goal of our pilot project that, that we're starting together. So my perspective comes from my previous experiences in the, in the transportation provider space and my focus in software with Goen to help social service organizations to have those kinds of tools to improve that coordination and, and communication. And as Julie mentioned, I grew up in Yakima, Washington with the family NEMT business. Now in the early 80s, MedStar was one of the first to provide wheelchair accessible rides. And even today is one of the few providers that provide those 24-7, 365 days a year. And growing up in the 90s, I was often the tech support. And we had to come up with innovative ways to provide rides across people um, across the state of Washington. And we've had traditionally a great experience and long working history working with the brokers in Washington State and working with Seattle Children's Hospital as, uh, as MedStar. And now after college, I came back to Yakima in 2010 to run the family business. And one of the unique things that we've built at MedStar is a culture of going the extra mile. And this is one thing that I think is important. I think it's important to have options of providers that, that you can use. And sometimes taxi providers are a great fit. Sometimes uh, hourly paid NEMT drivers can be a great fit. And having those multiple options in your toolkit is one of the fundamental um, core principles of the Goen software platform. Now, one thing, this picture here is of me several years ago when several and all the transportation services shut down because of a snowstorm in eastern Washington. And MedStar continued to operate as usual, providing on time rides. And um, the news crew came out and was asking how we do that. And a lot of it has to do with our extra training that we give our drivers. And in fact, we had the opportunity to work with HopeLink directly and bring several Eastern Washington drivers who are very snow experienced over to the west side to drive around and all that west side Seattle snow that you guys got last week. And uh, HopeLink, of course, and Seattle Children's did a great job. And it was great to have struggles to really bring uh, teams together and figure out how we can uh, work together and, and solve the challenges that, that happen even during the worst weather time. Now, recently MedStar purchased Mercy Transportation and they're working to expand that 24 seven service in Western Washington. You should see that in the coming months. And MedStar also added 10 vehicles to the Western fleet to help with on-demand transportation. Now, moving on, um, so from my experiences working with medical facilities and Medicaid brokers like HopeLink and People for People, combined with my software background, I started the mission to build a platform that would bridge the equity, accessibility, and technology gaps that exist in transportation today. Now, that platform is called Goan.org, and in addition to our NEMT transportation focus, one of the notable things that we're working on in the Tampa Bay area in Florida is a partnership with the FTA on their Mobility On Demand grant to provide a universal mobility platform for brokering on-demand paratransit rides to lift, care ride, wheelchair transport, and a variety of taxi systems. Now, to bridge the access gap, we work with NEMT providers and other transportation providers. And to bridge the equity gap, we partner with brokers. And to bridge the technology gap, we work with medical facilities. And these partnerships set up the rules to empower the riders and their personal care attendants to have more self-service in their transportation and more autonomy. Now we've gone to great efforts and have a great system that caters to those without mobile phones, but we recognize the integral part that each of these partners play and need to continue to do so for lasting success. This image here, sorry, I was just going to touch base on that out of cue. We work with people with all kinds of uh, disabilities. Gary is visually impaired here and he uses a mobile phone. Um, to book a ride without having to, to see the app. And he's able to pick between five different providers to get a subsidized ride that qualifies as ADA paratransit from Lyft, 
United Taxi or a variety of other NEMT providers to where he needs to go. Okay, thank you. A last slide. Now, building open coordination is really the goal, and we're excited about this partnership with Seattle Children's and People for People and MedStar. It allows us to work on shared aspirations of improving healthcare and iterate on the advancements in coordination and communication with the hopes to provide you and the industry insights to learn from. Now, Goan isn't the only software in this space, as it's no secret that transportation is changing. But we are looking for partners in Washington to work with to help fix the harder problems and the often overlooked ones. If you have any direct questions for me, you can reach me at justin at goin.org. Thank you very much. Thanks, Justin. Okay, so we want to col collaborate with everyone. What does this mean? Well, first I'll say what it does not mean. It does not mean that I want everyone to call me and tell me the difficulties they are having with Medicaid transportation. Once again, I would find that extremely overwhelming and probably very scary. What it does mean is that I want us to have a collective voice. Going back to what worked in our own organization is that when we had one voice, we were able to make people and organizations accountable. I realize that I am extremely fortunate to work for an organization with lots of resources and a loud voice, but I know what it's like to have a small voice and not be heard. And so I encourage you all to take the survey that I'm going to bring up next as many times as you want. You can take it once you, you can take it once, you can take it every time the situation happens to make you upset. But I will, so, will say if you go a little crazy on me, it will track your IP address. So keep that in mind. You can sign up to be on my work group, which I think will probably be mainly by phone, but maybe not. I haven't quite figured that out yet. Whatever you decide, I do want you to feel that your voice is heard. So we want to collaborate. So this is an example of another survey that I did. If there is a bubble or a section that is missing on today's survey, let me know. We want to be able to have as many buckets as we can so we can collect as much data as we can in a fairly easy fashion. Bubbles are easier than comments because bubbles will automatically go into a chart like this one and you will be able to see how big of an issue something is. We will be able to extrapolate the data so that we know who has issues with what, just like we did on this survey. It is my hope to have a collective voice that either includes HopeLink or we take to HopeLink to resolve. And we will include HCA in the work that we do. It is important that the governing body knows the issues and has the ability to speak on them or help resolve them. The people I know at HCA are truly wonderful, and in my experience, they really like data. They like to know how big a problem is. So take the survey. Let me know what I forgot. Single complaints don't change things, but I think that having a collective voice could be a very empowering. This slide shows a link to the survey and the work group, as well as people doing the hokey pokey. Why? Because that's what it's all about. <laughs> Let's go do something. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Julie and Justin. Very informative. We appreciate your comments today and uh, hearing about your experience. And I'm going to pause and ask Melissa, who's been busily monitoring chat, do we have questions in there? We do not currently. Okay. You know what? We will just Give it another minute or two then to see if folks have uh, questions they want to chat in. You can chat it into the chat box or put your hand up if you want us to unmute you. Um, a question that came up for me, Julie, while you were speaking was a couple of times you noted that Seattle Children has a loud voice, which I think we all can agree is true <laughs> in terms of you know, the size <laughs> of healthcare players in the Seattle area. Um, what would be your initial advice to a small, we, we, very often on these, webinars, you know, we get people from a variety of care settings. So I'm yeah. assuming we have some folks who are maybe from slightly smaller organizations. What would be your advice to them for step one, you know, knowing that maybe they don't have the loudest voice in town? I would say if I was a small place, I would, um, whenever a driver came in, I would offer them chocolate. I would ask <laughs> if they would like to use the bathroom. We have had drivers walk in and say, I'm so glad I'm here because I love your bathroom. 
you're like, okay, great. <laughs> um, it's amazing. You know, they're used to people um, not wanting to help them. They're used to people telling them to move their car. They're used to people ignoring them. I think it speaks volumes when a driver comes in and knows that they're going to be helped. They, the drivers, love the Hopeling desk, partly because we have great staff, but partly because they know that they can walk in and stop at the desk right inside the door. Doesn't matter if it has who's sitting at that desk, but if that driver can walk in and say, I'm looking for this family, will you please help me? And the person says, yes, I will find them for you. Sit down, go to the bathroom, get a drink then the driver feels like he is in a place that he wants to come back to. And uh, it's pretty much as simple as that, I think. Thank you. Anything else come in in the meantime? We do have two questions. One is from Monica, and she asks, does Seattle Children's only use NEMT providers that are Medicaid contractors? So the broker, you are required, if you want the Medicaid, if you want Medicaid to pay for it, then you are required to go through HopeLink and have them select whatever provider they want to select. If you don't care if Medicaid um, does pay for it, then you can contract with anybody. And we happen to contract with a company called Bilen. B-I-L-E-N, transportation. Another question? Yes, we have another question from Lisa, um, and she asks, what about the patients that do not qualify for Medicaid transportation? Um, are there resources available for them? And um, the desk that you have at Seattle Children's, are they available to help those folks? You know, that is a really great question. I was talking about that on my way here, as a matter of fact. <laughs> um, unfortunately, you know, families that are right above the Medicaid cutoff are the ones that have uh, the most challenges. We are lucky in the fact that we're right by the link rail, and so we can give them either a bus ticket to get down to the link rail, we have an employee shuttle that gets down to the link rail, and so I have a hard time um, saying no when somebody appears before me with crying or big eyes. Um, so I think that you just kind of need to be creative when it comes to those families. We got a grant with King County Mobility Coalition a while back to help families um, who are right above Medicaid transportation. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have any more? Not at this time. All right, well, we'll give it just a few seconds, maybe a minute more, to see if anyone else has anything they want to chat in this afternoon. I would like to encourage people to take the survey or sign up for the work group. I think that it's something that, you know, it's super easy to sit in your cube or your office or your desk and, you know, to just kind of complain at random. But I think that uh, folks that require Medicaid transportation, um, we should help them. Well, thanks to everyone for joining us. Thank you, Julie, and thank you, Justin. And um, this, link, this link to the survey is here. There's also, we'll be sending a link about today's event. We will be posting this on the Healthier Here website, the recording of this webinar, the PowerPoint presentation, as well as a transcript mm -hmm. of this yes, and we are, discussion. Let us know if you have been following the captioning today. Uh, how it went, how we can improve that in the future, what you think of including this in the future. And um, thank you all very much. We are wrapping it up within our one hour window. <laughs> all right, thank you everyone. Thank you.